And now I want to show you a form of meditation which was explained to me by a Zen master who said it really is one of the very best kinds of meditation, even better than sitting for a long time and getting your knees aching. What you do is you just put your hands on your hips with the wrist upwards. And now, let's all laugh. <laughs> to funny again, and then a little bit back to creepy at the very end. Also, I noticed that there were some people who were walking in right at the end who were probably like, what in the world is, is going on? But uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Jake. I'm, I'm happy to be able to uh, share with you today, and also I have a special guest that I will get to in just a moment. But, uh, you know, we've been nearing the finish line of our series called Thrival. And, and this has been a series of messages where we've really asked this question, what does it look like to live life in a way of, of fullness, to have a sense of meaning and groundedness, presence, a sense of connection with one another? That's really what we're talking about when we use the word spiritual. And, you know, sometimes when we began our, our times together, we'd play a video that included uh, this quote from Maya Angelou. It's been sort of a, a motto for this series. And so I want to I share it again. My mission in life is not merely to survive, but to thrive and to do so with some passion, some compassion, some humor, and some style. And today, we're really going to be parking on that, that humor piece, right? Because think about it. Think about your life. And just imagine for a second, could you imagine a time in life where you were thriving, where you felt fulfilled, where you felt energized, where you weren't laughing, right? Where you weren't experiencing humor, where there wasn't a sense of lightness, right? Because laughter, friends, it's an indication of hope. That even in the most difficult moments of our lives, there can be still glimmers of light shining in. Laughter reorients us to some very difficult situations, giving ourselves a new perspective. And so, in, uh, in, just a f in just a couple of minutes, we're going to talk to someone today who has experienced uh, humor really as, as transforming their life, as, as, as pulling them into a new season of life. But really quickly before that, I just want to quickly connect this idea of humor as a, as a spiritual practice, as a tool that we can literally add to our Thrival Toolkit as, as something that uh, really is central to, to this, this series and who we are as a community. See... We have spiritual conversations here. And again, when we use that word spiritual, we're really just talking about really what does it mean to be alive, right? To live from a place of our values and a sense of presence. And naturally, during these conversations, we laugh together, right? Or during the music or me the meditation, all of it, we have a, there's a sense of laughter and lightness. Not because there is this need to be funny, right? But actually because reality itself is funny. Reality itself is a bit ridiculous, a bit bizarre, right? A bit absurd. And for me personally, when I when I look at my own spirituality and my journey, it's a been it's been a lot of embracing life and accepting life on life's terms. And when you do that, the reality is that life as it is has a lot of weirdness to appreciate, a lot of strangeness. And when we stop trying to logically make sense of everything and we allow life to be what it is, there's certainly a lot worth laughing at. In fact, we see this reflected in many spiritual traditions and we look at some of the great spiritual teachers who used different forms to communicate. Jesus, for example, he spoke primarily in parables 
or you have the Zen masters who, who spoke primarily with, uh, in, in terms of the koans, which both parables and koans are these forms of, of telling a story or, or sort of communicating some idea in a way that subverts expectation, that works within paradox. And in a lot of ways, they function like jokes, okay? And so what I want to do, if we, if we can look at, at how humor is baked into and embedded in our spiritual traditions, and what I want to do quickly is just give you four quick reasons why I believe that comedy is spiritual. And the first is this. Laughter is medicine, right? When you laugh... You experience an oxygen-rich blood flow. You you are adding oxygen to your lungs, to your blood. You, you release endorphins in your brain and other chemicals that actually give you a sense of happiness and well-being. Laughter is, is really a form of breathing, right? And it's not that we laugh because there's no pain or no suffering in our lives. See, crying is also a very powerful way of, of experiencing emotion and energy moving throughout the body. But laughter is too. It allows us to get in our body. It allows us to experience and release and, and really let go of sometimes blocked emotion. So laughter is medicine. Humor is Alchemy. See, we, we recently talked about this symbol, this idea of alchemy as something that comes from the Middle Ages. And really, it's this idea that, that you know, there was a point in history where people called alchemists engaged in a sort of philosophy and science where they tried to transform different materials, right? But they also believed that you could experience a similar transformation in the body, that there was a sort of alchemizing that could happen in the body. And the way that they believed is that they felt that if you could really affect the, the substances and energies in the body, you could experience a different health outcome. Of course, this is true for us today, but they understood it very differently, that it had different language, different terms. And one of the terms that was very important to them was, was something called your humors. See, the term, the word humor comes from this, this idea that, that it was believed that we had these substances and energies in the body that contributed to life. And, and we know this to be true today, but they called it your humor. So we get that term from really that earlier understanding of physical biology. But yet there's something true about that, that when we laugh, right, when we experience humor, we also can recognize that a healing or a transformation has taken place, right? Of course, there is always such a thing as it being too soon to laugh about something. But as the Hebrew scriptures say in Ecclesiastes, there is a time to laugh and a time to cry, right? And so recognizing those different times and allowing the energy to move in that way. Or as Alan Watts says, real religion is the transformation of anxiety into laughter. Just... Uh, uh, this past, or about a week and a half ago, Olivia and I had the opportunity to take a little trip together as a way of reconnecting. And, you know, sometimes as a couple, you go through these different seasons where you realize, oh, man, we've disconnected. We are we're kind of living in our own little worlds, in our own little bubbles, you know, whether it's busyness or travel, whatever it might be. And so we, we took this opportunity and we found, really, we found our way back to each other and really deeply reconnected to, e to each other in a really special way. And, and in doing so, we had this experience where we were able to look back at these different points in time where we realized, wow, look at how, how we had disconnected. Look at how we were acting. Look at how we were behaving and how, how sort of our experience of the relationship looked so different when we had felt disconnected. And, and in that moment, what arose for us was laughter. We began to hysterically laugh at ourselves at how absurd it had been that we sometimes in life seem to stray so far from who we really are, right? We seem to stray so far from how we really believe that we are able to show up in a relationship and in life. And sometimes, friends, you can actually laugh at yourself at the absurdity because you've recognized that's not who I truly am. And I can let that go. Laughter and humor can be alchemy in that way. The third reason, friends, is that comedy speaks truth to power, okay? There's, there's, there's a... Uh, a term in comedy called punching up and punching down. See, punching down is when you make a joke at an expense of someone who maybe has less than you, is less fortunate, is facing more difficult like life circumstances than you, and you're making a joke at their expense. Generally, this is bad form, and this is the kind of joke that we usually have incredible, you know, and, and, a, and a valid distaste for, because it doesn't feel right. There's something inherently wrong about it. That's punching down, but punching up is critiquing systems of power, right, that oppress people. 
critiquing people that uphold these systems of wealth disparity or, or systems of hierarchical power that keep people uh, trapped, right? And in that sense, Jesus was a great example of a comedian because he spoke in these parables that so often were punching up, right? They were satiring, critiquing systems of power. I'll give you an example. There is a parable of Jesus, and it's found in the Gospel of Thomas. Now, this is a gospel that did not make its way into the New Testament, but uh, many people believe that uh, it was intentionally left out because some of the teachings actually reflect, you know, the real heart of the mystical Jesus, but we won't get into that today. Uh, but in, in verse 63 of the Gospel of Thomas, it says, it says this parable of his, and it says, Jesus said, there was a rich man who had considerable wealth. He said, I shall invest my wealth so as to sow, reap, plant, and fill my barns with crops, lest I run short of something. These things are what he was thinking in his heart, and the very night the man died. Whoever has ears should listen. Now, I want to step back for a second and really ask ourselves, what is Jesus saying here? He's basically saying, hey, there was this guy who was very rich, and he spent all his time thinking about how he could get richer and hold on to his wealth. Uh, and one night he was thinking about it, and he died. The end. That's, that's the story, okay? If you think about it, it's a joke. He's poking fun at these sometimes ridiculous ways we approach life, what we think matters, right? What we think society should look like. There's this another another example. Um, you know, many many of us who grew up in the Christian tradition might have remembered this this story in this parable where Jesus says, "Give to Caesar what is Caesar's; give to God what is God's." Basically, he's in this situation where these Pharisees come to him, as they often did, and tried to trap him. And they said, "Jesus, should we be paying taxes?" Which I guess you know, following April fifteenth, this is actually a pretty relevant, you know. I don't know how I feel about this. I didn't think about that. But, uh, you know, they're asking him, Jesus, should we be paying taxes? And he, he says, he holds up a coin, and the coin has Caesar's name and face on it. And he says, look, if, if Caesar wants this, if Caesar wants every coin with his face on it, if he's that narcissistic, let him have it, you know? Give to Caesar's what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. He's satiring the whole system. See, Jesus always lifted up those beneath him. But he was not afraid to critique those who had money and were withholding from, from the poor, those who were, you know, cementing institutionalized systems of power. There is a beauty in punching up. Lastly, number four, humor prevents us from taking ourselves too seriously, or it allows us to engage in what I like to call unserious spirituality. How many of us have found that at different times in our life, our, our major turnoff from religion or even spirituality was this sense that everyone who does it takes themselves way too seriously. Anyone else? Friends, I think, I think that one of the greatest dangers we face in the spiritual path is taking ourselves too seriously. Why do you think I have a mullet, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Here's the reality, friends, and it's something that so often gets missed in spiritual spaces, okay? We, we are all human, every last one of us, okay? Which means we all poop, right? We all get upset at dumb things. We all look in the mirror in the morning and try to find that perfect angle to convince ourselves it's all going to be good, you know? We all find hairs on our body thinking, like, do I even bother getting rid of this or is anyone ever going to see it? You know, we all have these human experiences and we pretend that we don't have them. We show up into to faith community and, and spiritual spaces and, and we're encouraged to kind of almost pretend at times that it's not the reality. And, and so I, my hope for us in this community and in life is that we can engage in this unserious spirituality because laughter friends is not just medicine for the body but it's medicine for our spiritual journey we were meant to be human right we're here to be human and to become more human and yet it's also true of of engaging in the deep mysteries see Lao Tzu who wrote the Tao Te Ching I want to share a quote of his but I do want to just remind you that you know when, when Lao Tzu writes about the Tao in the Tao Te Ching, he's, he's using a word that, you know, again, we don't have a direct translation for, but you might say God, you might say source, you might say the universe, you might even say kind of the truth behind everything, right? The truth, the deepest truth. And Lao Tzu says this, if it were not laughed at, it would not be sufficient to be Tao. 
that if if your deepest truth doesn't hold within it some some element of laughter, some element of lightness, right? Then maybe take a second look, because friends, when we take things too seriously, it just sucks all the joy out, right? But when we recognize that there is a lightness and a laughter and a humor present through the whole thing, through the spiritual traditions that many of us hold so dear, we can see that there is this reminder and this this pointing to, to, hey, it's okay to critique systems of power. Hey, it's okay to take some difficult moments in your life and reapproach them with some laughter. In fact, I think that the modern day comedian especially if you know where to look, can be an an invitation. They can inspire us and invite us to see things in that way. There's some incredible, profound truths and healing that we can engage in with with even that that, the modern expression of that art form of of comedy. And so what I want to do for the rest of our time together is I want to invite someone who is a local legend in the Tucson comedy scene, and she she didn't agree with that, apparently, but... uh, (laughs) She also uh, just instructed a, a group of us uh, at Aldea in, in this comedy workshop that you have an opportunity to uh, up, watch our show afterwards. But I want to invite to the stage Nancy Stanley. Welcome her to the stage. So some people here are meeting you for the first time. And I'd just love if you gave a little introduction about yourself and maybe what was your journey getting into comedy? Okay, yeah, I am happy to be back again, though. The guy with the mullet took most of my material. I was even going to use that Ecclesiastes thing, but I couldn't remember it was Ecclesiastes, so I couldn't use it. Anyway, um, so I've been here with the Women's Luncheon a couple of times, uh, and I'm friends with a number of people who attend here. I um, I became a comic uh, as kind of an act of rebellion from old age. Uh, I was I was 57 years old. I hadn't started having kids till I was 40, and I... Um, my marriage, as they got older, my marriage was unspooling. An honorable man, but a very lonely marriage. My children were leaving the nest. They no longer needed me to take care of them or tell them not to eat the dog food. I was just like the ATM, and I could see it. I could see it all unspooling, and there would come the day that I had nobody to take care of but me. And I had completely forgotten how to do that. That might resonate for some of you women, for some of you moms out there. So for his 16th birthday, I took my son to see the Lewis Black comedy show, the Lewis Black comedy show, if those of you who know, uh, up in Phoenix. And I hadn't paid much attention to comedy. I'd always loved to laugh. I come from a kind of funny family. Um, And for some reason, it was the day I told him his dad and I were going to separate on the drive up. And it was the biggest weight off of me. And then we got to the venue in Phoenix, and my nosebleed seats had been upgraded to front row seats, which felt a little mystical. Now I understand that they hadn't sold the front row tickets. And so it was just, but, um, and watching, of course, I was in, I was in exactly the mood to take something from the universe because I had just unburdened myself of something big. And you know how physicists say you don't find the matter if not for the void? Well, that was exactly the case with me. And Lewis Black came out on stage, a story I've told a lot, and I sat there and was absolutely amazed by the energy transfer, not by what he was saying, but by what was coming back to him in terms of love and understanding and human connection, sometimes derision, sometimes dislike, but the emotional energy exchange was different than a play where you have a little bit of a wall because the content, it was true human connection. And I said, unfortunately, out loud, I want to do that. Everybody in the front row was mad at me and didn't think it belonged there. Um, And so I just, I went in, I, I... used some money that my mom had given me for my birthday, and I went to New York, and I took a comedy camp, and I was horrible, and I threw up before the first time I did it. And and many times afterwards, I learned not to drink while doing comedy, because only I'm funnier. Uh, I'm the only one who thinks I'm funnier when I drink. Um, I learned a lot of lessons, but I also think that I learned, I learned to naturally do something in my old age 
that has helped me get through a stroke, the death of both of my parents, continuing health problems, and just, just the, the stuff that we all go through in life. And that is, I really do take a moment, I take a breath, and I say, can I laugh at this? When I'm in the middle of a, pardon my French, shit storm, I think, can, can I laugh at this? And sometimes the answer is, nope, not yet. <laughs> and sometimes the answer is, yeah, you can. And may I tell a story? I know you have other questions, but, you know, I have the mic now. So, <laughs> so um, you gave it to me. You were warned. So yesterday was the 19th anniversary of the day my father died. After a very long illness, he died cell by cell. It was horrible. My mother was his constant caretaker. The family was exhausted. And I remembered last night this story. My mom and I were getting him dressed for after he had died, just after he had died. There was something important to her about dressing before the hospice people came. I honestly don't think they would have judged, but, you know, whatever. And so she wanted to bathe him, like in a kind of a biblical kind of thing. It was her last thing to do. So I'm standing on one side of the hospital bed, and she's standing on the other. And she says, I'd like to change daddy's PJs. And I said, OK. We got new PJs out. And as I was putting them on, I had to tug his arm back a little bit. And we heard it unmistakable, pop. <laughs> and I had broken my dead dad's arm. And my mom and I, it was just the most horrifying moment. And we started looking at each other. And we both broke out laughing and crying at the same time. But that's the trick about what we're asked to do in this life. We're asked to have this incredible duality to hold space for the pain of children in war, the pain of a friend who's ill, the pain of our own worries, money worries, everything. And at the same time, we have to find the joy that's out there. And finding the balance is always the problem, right? Keeping it calibrated doing that so that's a really long answer but okay i told you comedians right like oh my goodness you know it's interesting because i think too like you're talking about this journey of being really self-reflective and i know that for many of us here we have these different tools journaling whatever it might be to allow us to reflect on our own journeys therapy right for you and specifically knowing that maybe not a lot of people here have have done comedy like what is it like to write material about yourself and maybe how does that heal you spoke a little bit about that but like you know let people in on that journey yeah well uh first of all i'm a really lazy writer and so when i write a joke, a joke rather than a bit, which is larger. It is like my baby that I wanted for a long time. And even if you don't like the joke, man, I'll keep telling you that joke again and again and again until somebody laughs. Um, so material is hard to craft. The way I approach it is what I did in your workshop, which was pick three things in your life, big, little, whatever. And let's spin out four to six little points in that. Let's identify what's specific. It isn't enough to say, I don't like President blank blank, right? You have to say, now, why don't I like him? And, and really go through that. What are the consequences? What are the consequences to me? What are the consequences to others? And then you go through and say, what's unique about that? What, what's funny about that? And then you start the process of wordsmithing it, because there are some things that we know about the human brain that one of the things that make us laugh is disruption or misdirection. You know, saying one thing and meaning another, satire, sarcasm. Ooh, I'm, I use that too much as a comedy ploy, but, um, but that's a good one, unless you're married. Um, <laughs> it's not so good. Uh, I don't know. Did I lose the question? I think no, I did. I okay. think it's great, and I think that you know, as you're, as you're crafting, you're also um, just being thoughtful about like, what do I even think about different things? And sometimes I feel like we go through life and we're not even really reflective. Like, how, do I have my own opinions, you know? And so it's beautiful that it gives you the opportunity to kind of like. Right. And, you know, no discussion of humor or comedy, which is the art form of getting people to laugh. It's a, it's a different thing. Um, but 
We have to talk about the really historically negative effects of comedy, its use in propaganda, particularly during the Nazi era. Um, you know, in demonizing, I mean, it's as early as the mid-30s, there were tracks being put out that demonized Jews and gypsies and, um, and gay people. And, and then we have, you know, the whole idea of punching down. Let's make that group of people the other, and let's tell funny stories about them and, and droll things. And that ultimately gives us license to hurt those people. Um, and comedy has played a really big part in that. So there is, in my mind, a sense of, or a mandate to be kind of ethical in comedy. Yeah. And not always. I mean, I'm dirty. <laughs> you might disagree with my topic, but but I'm pretty careful about doing that. I mean, the problem with that, though, is you, because you can also go so far, and I suppose people would refer to this as political correctness. I, I don't like that term, but... I think you go so far trying not to say anything offensive to anyone that you really stray from your authenticity and your point. Right. Because you have to own your opinions. True. But then, of course, Jesus punched up and then he got killed for that. So it's like you're kind of like... Yeah. Not, not a follower in that sense. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> not not going to do that. You know, I think a lot of what you're talking about is the intentionality behind it, you know? And and I think, again, when we're, when we're talking spirituality here, so much of what we're talking about is just intentionality, living from a place of intentionality, right? And so it doesn't necessarily have to connect with any particular spiritual tradition or faith. It's just a way of being in the world. And so using that broad definition, I'm curious sort of how you think that you know, as, as you've defined it, not only humor, but comedy can be can be spiritual. Again, using that broader definition. So when Denise, where's Denise? Where, where's Denise? Oh, there you are. I can't see. I'm old. Um, when Denise was talking, I was thinking about how her new relationship with her baby. And the research on babies tells us a lot about how we are bound together by laughter and comedy. And so what they found is that babies will laugh at things by themselves, but they laugh longer and harder as a response to being around other people. And in fact, when they are given a prompt that's supposed to be something that they want to look at or that pleases, uh, generally pleases babies, they will often look around the room for a caretaker to laugh with them or to respond with them. And I think that's, a, I think that the fact that laughter and its structure, comedy, um, they're there for social connection. Some uh, scientists, early childhood scientists, that think, think that uh, babies, and you kind of captured it, um, that babies smile and laugh as a way of rewarding us for the safety and attention we give them. And that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Because there's nothing to laugh about if you're a baby. I mean, you don't know anything. You're dropped there. You, you know, you have it needs that you don't understand. But it, um, it's some anthropologists think it replaced grooming behavior. Um, that that grooming behavior among humans, among early humans, showed kind of. Mm, you can unfakeable attention and care for another person. We wouldn't call it love, but that made you safe, right? That was those. That was your tribe, and babies do the same thing. Um, and so, if you look at it as essentially human connection and living out the unique spiritual and psychological capacity that we have, comedy really is like a central building block. Right. It gives us safety, yeah. except when it doesn't. <laughs> well, and, and I know for me, it's helpful when talking about how, you know, something ties in spiritually. It's helpful to look at, like you brought in science, and also, like, historically, what is the human relationship to this art form or to this experience been like? Some things... They change and evolve, and yet there are also a lot of universal themes. So as someone who teaches comedy, do you, do you have any kind of insights for us on how comedy has shown up throughout history and sort of the anthropology of how we developed? Yeah, uh, yes and no. Uh, I do have some thoughts on that, and I've taught that before. I, it, it takes a long time to get into it and out of it, and I'd be glad to talk at another time, kind of with the, the whole timeline, but... Um, I, th I think, if, if I had to kind of shorthand this, comedy is a circuit breaker. 
to protect us from uh, over has probably been its most valuable resource. You know, that's the underpinning of the First Amendment. That if you let people say what they need to say and get it out, then they're less likely to be violent. And so comedy in particular has been an art form that allows us to make fun, even sometimes not productively, but to, to make fun of the things in our lives that frustrate us, the thing that happens to us, the things that we share. Our, it, it helps us moderate our own failings, right? Because if I tell you something about me that's embarrassing, then that that sharing, I've gotten it off my chest. But I really think that over time, comedy's most important function has been as a circuit breaker against violence. Kind of that, if you if you don't laugh, you'll cry, or if you don't laugh, you'll become violent. I, I do think that is the tradition of it. And you will find, so there's this guy who goes around and he looks at, um, he looks at hieroglyphics and ancient writings and depictions, uh, and he does this across all, um, well, not all, but several different kind of ancient societies. And what he finds is there's this constant source of beating the mammoth. There's this constant thing where there are pictures that are not explainable from factual ways. And we know that early peoples drew pictures to describe their lives. But these were always like the guy's hitting the mammoth, <laughs> or the mammoth is small and the guy is big. And those were considered early forms of humor. They were disruptive. But they also probably gave people kind of like, yeah, that doesn't happen, ha, ha, ha. Um, I don't know what early people thought or how they did that, but they, they probably served as kind of a way to build courage to go back and face things. Yeah. You know? So it's so it's been with us for such a long Forever. time. Forever. And it's helped us navigate life. Um, and I'm curious, you know, as someone who teaches uh, other people how to approach something, which I know for many people they think of comedy as th their worst nightmare of stepping up on stage and trying to do this. But I personally have found that there's, there's, um, there's so many just lessons through a comedy that are applicable to life. So I'm curious, what are some lessons that you would give to aspiring comedians that you would also just give to aspiring humans? You're going to fail. <laughs> Isn't that fun? Isn't that inspiring? But the truth is you learn to live with failure. I mean, getting up on a stage and talking about stuff that's out of your head and your life is really scary and you do have lots of fear and I still have some fear in some settings, but there is nothing more freeing than admitting who you are and how you failed and how you're gonna fail in the future. It is an absolutely freeing kind of thing. Now I'll leave here and I'll obsess like, oh, I should have answered that question better. And, you know, but, but to be able to do it and feel happy doing it and feel happy like being a screw up because I am and maybe none of you are, but all those other people outside of this room are. And that's just how life is. We make mistakes. We've got to. And when you talk about we show up fully, well, part of showing up fully means bringing the stuff you're not necessarily proud of. There's a saying that comedy in comedy, you you can't shroud the parts of yourself you most want to shroud. Because if you're gonna get anywhere in a world of comedy that's mostly observational and personal now, not necessarily all of it, but if you wanna get anywhere with an audience, if you want any kind of reaction, you can't be inauthentic. They know it. And audiences decide what's funny, not comics. Can we give a big round of applause to Nancy? <laughs> More time! More time! <laughs>